Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 83. I've been around the internet a long time. In fact, and I'm dating myself here, I was using it before it was called the internet, when it was ARPANET. Before there was even the domain name system, back then it was all research and education. And in fact, commercial use was explicitly forbidden since the government had paid for it. That changed in 1994 and the rest is history. Back when we were communicating by listservs and Usenet, I saw one day an FAQ appear on lambing, what farmers need to do with sheep. And I cited that as my watershed moment in the evolution of the internet away from just a sandbox for scientists and students. If I'd seen an FAQ on construction instead, it would have served just as well as that moment. And now I had a similar experience when I heard about today's guest because he's applied AI to construction. In fact, that was his thesis with the title of The Operational Efficiency Frontier. Rene Morcas is the founder of Alice Technologies and teaches at Stanford University's PhD program in construction engineering. He's a second generation civil engineer with over 15 years of construction industry experience, including working as a project manager in Afghanistan, underwater pipeline construction, and automation engineering on a $350 million gas refinery expansion project in Abu Dhabi. Have you ever visited a construction site and seen there was hardly anyone there? Rene did. Did you wonder where they all were and why they weren't working? Rene did. And then he put AI to work on the problem. Let's find out how in the interview. Rene, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Peter. Thank you. So I looked at your PhD thesis, tried to understand it. I want you to Tell me a little bit about it, but in particular, start with what experience was it that triggered your choice of looking at advanced computation and artificial intelligence in, of all things, construction? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for reading it. You now belong to a select group of, I think, 10 people in the world that have done so. <laughs> but for me, you know, as, as all PhDs, I was looking for a topic. Uh, and I was just, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to research and what I wanted to do and so on. And what I did was I, I did what they colloquially call an industrial PhD. And what that means is I spent six months studying and six months working. I did that for the duration of the program. And during those six months where I was working, I was happened to find myself on the construction of the cruise ship terminal in Amsterdam. And that cruise ship terminal at the time was six weeks late. And each day was 50,000 euros. And I was in the meeting, and there were, let's just say it was, a, it was a relatively heated, excited argument, given the fact that they were looking at six weeks times 50,000 euros per day, which meant that they had just kind of blown through their profit margin on the job. And when they were sitting there sort of arguing, I got up you know, to take a little bit of a breather from the, the tension around the table, sort of walked over to the window, and I looked outside, and I kind of remember kind of listening to the subcontractor who was very adamantly explaining that he could not work any faster. Like, I can't work any faster. I can't work. Any, you know, I can't do it. can't be done. And I looked outside and it hit me. I looked outside and there was 100,000 square foot of empty space and four people in it. And I thought to myself, holy cow, construction sites are empty. And because I was always kind of volunteering the odd jobs and construction sites, by then... I had already worked on like 20 jobs. And I remember thinking, going back in my head to like this one, that one, that one. I kind of went back through time to every job I'd been on. And I realized like, yeah, it's true. Right as I was staring out through that window, I was like, construction sites are empty. Drive down the highway, look at a construction site. And you might see, you know, some pockets of work, but generally lots of empty space. So I thought to myself, like, is this really true? Is it really true that construction sites are empty? Well, I looked through all the literature, search and search and search, didn't really find much on it. So I thought to myself, well, you know what? I can measure this. So I sort of set up an experiment where each four columns was a bay, and I would measure whether that bay was occupied or not. And so each of the bays, if the bay was occupied, I'd measure it as a sort of one, and if it was non-occupied, as zero. And so I did this experiment once in the Netherlands, twice in the U.S. 
and on relatively, you know, decent sized jobs. Did it on a $120 million project that was a building that was coming up at Stanford. I did it on another sort of larger job here in the US. And I did it on a, I think it was a $70 million seven story kind of high rise in the loads. And each time I got that the average construction space that's used for construction is 3%. So that was how the PhD dissertation started. I see. And and construction projects are notorious for going over budget and schedule. It's got to the point here when I see a sign go up on the road that says planning to construct such and such a bypass will cost $50 million and be done by next summer. I go, yeah, right. And it'll take twice as long and cost twice as much. Mm -hmm. And now there's a difference though between a construction site being sparsely populated and the failure of project planning. And I'm reminded, for instance, of movie sets. Every time I go to a movie set, you see a hundred people sitting around doing nothing. And off in a corner somewhere, there's like two people working really hard at something. And then eventually it all comes together for 15 seconds of madness. Mm -hmm. And then it's quiet again. So it seems like an opportunity for the same kind of principle to apply. But where is the slack though? I could look at like the experience of constructing our house. We've been through two phases of that. And it was very similar that at any given time, the construction site might be empty or there's something going on. And I'm looking at this going, you are supposed to be ready a month from now. I don't think that's going to happen. And also more of this work could go on in parallel as you're leading up to. But the slack there wasn't that they didn't schedule those people. So they were off doing other things. The construction industry is red hot here, has been for a a long time, and just getting people to show up is the problem. Was that the problem? Well, it's hard to imagine that the people who could have been on site were just sitting around somewhere else, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the phone to ring. Mm. Great, great point. So labor shortages are a fact worldwide. We've not talked to a single construction project that I can remember that said, oh, yeah, we've got lots of people and everybody's happy. That said, if you look at the literature, even in the best case scenarios, people on site spend 40% of their time building. They spend 60% of the time on other tasks, coordinating, getting ready for the job, reading plans, going to pick up tools, moving to where they should be, and so on and so forth. One of the major inefficiencies that you introduce into any construction system is the cycle time. And so what tends to happen on construction sites is that there's usually a cycle. So the carpenters go in, they do some work, the steel workers go in, do some work. The masons go in, pour the concrete, the concrete dries, and then the carpenters come in again, build the next layer on top, next floor. And so that cycle, there's a lot of area for improvement in the efficiency of those cycles. If you change the amount of form work, you change the number of crews, the number of people, the location of the cranes, all of those things affect your cycle times which ultimately is how Alice kind of introduces efficiency. It gives you a less downtime as people are waiting for the folks in front of them to get out of the way so they can go and do the work. So you're saying that it optimizes the use of the time, reduces the amount of time that uh, workers need to spend on site through taking inefficiency out of that? Yes. Um, and the numbers that you'll get is something that's really interesting about our approach is we can calculate average utilizations. And so the average utilizations tend to be somewhere around 50, 55, 45%. So, you know, a listener might hear this and say, wait, what the heck? Like, I work on a construction site. I don't work half the time. Sure, right? But those numbers actually very much tie into that 40% number that I just talked about. And the reason is that what the software is saying is that your direct construction time, like the time that you are directly building something, is roughly 50% of the time. And so what you'll see with the optimizations is that that number goes from 50 to, say, 58. Mm. You'll squeeze an additional, in this case, you know, eight, nine percentage points out of it. That eight, nine percentage points reduces durations by, you know, 10, 15 percent. Right. And that's significant. But of the time that they're not spent building, how much of it is necessarily productive? Because if I look at software development as an analogy, time spent typing code is not the only productive time. It's really what should happen at the end of a process of careful planning. And some sort of Dilbert-type boss looking at the activity going, you're not typing, type faster, is going to get the wrong product. 100%. So maybe I can kind of flip the question around. Like, would the objective be to reduce that, call it prep time? It's not direct construction, but it's 
that is productive, right? Would the objective be to reduce that to zero so you can spend 100% of the time building? No. But the question is, in that prep time, is roughly 8% of that prep time something that, that you could do away with? Yeah, absolutely. I've been in constructed sites. There's a lot of time you spend kind of sitting around, waiting for, for something to happen, you know, checking stuff. Like, unless if you're building, yeah, that's usually serious. But if you're waiting to build, you know, you're kind of cleaning the site. There is some laxness involved. So in that period, you can easily, you know, reduce that duration by 10% mm -hmm. and still get a very, very productive system. And if you do this, presumably also, there's the invisible time of how long it takes a contractor to reach the site. And if you reduce the number of times they have to go to the site, you reduce that overhead. Is that part of it? The way that we formulate the question that you're asking me is as follows. It's the objective function. So in optimization, you have an objective function, so something that you want to maximize or minimize. You know, let's say that we want to minimize duration, minimize cost, minimize time on site, minimize mobilization, demobilization. So for example, cranes, every time you take them off site and bring them on site, it costs you a pretty penny. And so the other thing you might want to minimize is the total number of cranes used or the total number of resources used. And so each of these objective functions is something that you can run through Alice. So you can tell Alice, hey, here's one option. I want you to finish everything as soon as possible. So you're like, well, why would you want to do that? Well, easy. Because if you finish as soon as possible, you're introducing some buffers between tasks, right? Alternatively, you could say, no, I don't want to finish as soon as possible. I just want to spend as least amount of time on site as possible. So what's kind of interesting is that what might happen is that some of the start times of the task get moved to later so that the start and the end time of some tasks get squeezed together. Mm. So the carpenters, originally you might sort of send them there on January 1st, and they might leave on June 1st. But now you might say, no, 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 I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the carpenters in on February 1st, and they'll leave on June 1st. So in that case, you're reducing the time on site, but you're also eliminating some of the buffer that's in your system. Right. So... Yeah, you can. The nice thing about running so many simulations, like you can, we can in the course of an afternoon run 600 simulations, is you can really set any objective function you want or combinations of objective functions and so on and so forth. And your thesis starts out with a very high level statement that it's about optimizing space and time. And my reaction on reading that was why not also money? Mm. Is that a factor that? is implied by space and time, or is it one that you can now add in, or, or am I missing something? No, not at all. My task as a PhD student was to develop theory. And as a PhD student, I intuitively knew that space, time, there's a much higher chance to find some mathematical relationship, which I ended up doing. Mm. Cost, on the other hand, is a very stepped function. It's a much more um, noisy world to be in, right? Cost doesn't really exist in sure. physics. But now you're in that world. You're not the PhD student any longer. So as you'll notice, then in the PhD, what I was doing was optimizing space usage and time, graduated, put on the CEO hat, threw the space usage out the window and replaced it with cost. Mm. So what we'll notice in our software today is we don't give anybody any of the space calculations or space usage calculations. Like that's not part of the software as far as the user's concerned. Right. We use it to do some back calculations, but what the users care about, and my job as a CEO, is to give solutions that give you something that is faster and cheaper. The old saying, faster, cheaper, better, pick one. Or two, but not all three. Yeah. And it strikes me this is a way of being really conscious about those sliders. And now in the thesis, you described models of where people work at their work site. You were modeling how much space they take up around them so that you can see whether that overlaps with anyone else's workspace. And, and if not, then they can work. As far as that went, is that a good characterization? Yeah, I mean, the way that it was modeled, if I answer the question, the way it was modeled was that what we were trying to do, or what I was trying to do, was figure out space usage is not a metric that's in our field. Nobody thinks about it. And so if you have an asset utilization of 3%, 3% of space in a construction site is used for construction. So, you know, the first thing that hit me, at least, like a lead brick, was, hey, 3%, I mean, there's 97% room for improvement. So the question that I was trying to answer was, well, how much space could you theoretically use for construction without things blowing up? Because you don't want to start scheduling people on top of each other. You don't want unsafe right. working environments. Well, and that was the point that I was getting at, because it looked like you were saying, we model that someone doing this job needs this much room around them to yes. occupy that space. And when they do, you can't put someone else in the same space. So 
the electrician and the plumber can't be working in the same bay at the same time. Yes. So it looks like the optimization that you were introducing there was the one of how can we move these objects through this space, occupying this amount of space around them without collisions. Is that? Yes. Yep. Okay. The research statement of the time was how can we maximize space usage mm -hmm. while eliminating spatial clashes? That was the idea. It's kind so of like a game. It's kind of like a multiplayer game where, in a way, that because you're dealing with space and time and objects moving around and collision detection, those are all aspects of something like a MMOR multiplayer, yeah, yeah it, massive it multiplayer out. online role game playing game. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But it turns out that there's a lot of optimization formulations in the literature that pertain to similar types of problems. Mm. And if you read it, there's all kinds of things like bin packing. And folks have been toying around with the space-time continuum trade-off between space and time in physics and mathematics and computer science. So there's lots of stuff that you can draw from. Mm -hmm. So that kind of answers the question why when I was working on theory as a PhD student, I kind of stuck to that space-time stuff. You know, whereas with the company, I moved it to cost. But I guess once I had answered that question, and so I had answered several questions, which is one that the maximum kind of space usage theoretically is somewhere around that 50, 55, 60%. The other thing that I answered was that like resequencing work changes the space usage, which changes the total duration of the project. It kind of makes sense. If you schedule more things concurrently, you finish faster. Scheduling more things concurrently increases space usage. Then once I kind of finished all of that, I started to get interested in, well, well, hold on. What if I start allowing scheduling spaces on top of each other, right? So what if I say, okay, you can overlap by 10% and then reduce production by 10%, productivity, I should say, by 10%. And so I ran a whole bunch of experiments. It turns out nobody really knows what those interaction functions look like. Like nobody can tell you that if somebody takes up 10% of my space, am I going to lose production or not? So I kind of, you know, did a bunch of sensitivity analysis. I tried a whole bunch of these, as I call, interaction functions. So if there was a 50% overlap, there was a 50% reduction in productivity. 10% hmm. overlap, 10% reduction in productivity. Then I made an aggressive one where 50% overlap stopped the work. So I tried all of that stuff. Turns out that, that it's not a good idea. Hmm. You should not have people, even if you're trying to speed things up, it is extremely difficult to do so if you start allowing things to overlap. Is that because they like bump into each other when they're going out for a bathroom break or fetching tools from the truck or? The productivity reduces. And even when I modeled the reduction in the productivity is very small. Here's the thinking. There's going to be a reduction in productivity because things are kind of scheduled in the same space at the same time, but you're gaining speed because you're doing more things at mm -hmm. once. So it was kind of an interesting theoretical question, right? Like which of the two would win? Mm. Are you going to gain more speed because you're overlapping or are you going to lose speed because you're losing production rates? How big does a project have to be before it's worth engaging your technologies? So currently we target projects that are about 100 million and up. In 2022, we're going to start releasing features that are going to start moving towards the smaller end of the market, say 25 million and up. What does that look like in terms of the size of the building or the project? So the way you want to think about it is, Anything larger than a single family home, three stories and up. That's how you want to think about it. That is next year. Currently today, what you're looking at in, you know, in the hundred million and up, you're looking at, I don't know, call it a 10 story high rise. You call it a, maybe a, some sort of a warehousing facility, right? That's sort of roughly kind of, you know, where we come in at. Right. Now, what's the AI technology here that's being brought to bear at that point? How does it show up? What do you have to tell it? And then what does it tell you? That's a great question. What, are the, what is the input? What is the output? The thing that we did with Alice is that we separated the rules that govern a project from the solution to those rules. So what humans are really good at is they're really good at telling you those rules. A human builder will tell you like, yeah, to build this concrete slab, I need these tasks, I need these resources, I need these durations. It's so like, great. So we built a tool that you can input the task, the resources, et cetera, that you need to build a given element. So for example, this is where I need to build a slab, apply it to all the slabs. This is what I need to build a column, apply it to all the columns. So what's really interesting about our approach is it's there's a multiplier. It's a very scalable way to encode those rules. And once you've done that, you can then start running simulations and see what's the fastest or the cheapest way to build something, right? Right. So it's got to be something then that has a lot of repeated elements in it. Like if you were building Toontown at Disneyland, 
it's all odd shapes and curves and custom thing doesn't repeat the same thing twice? Great question. So you would think so. The answer is yes and no. It depends. So if the difference between the shapes is in the size, the volume, the length, the width, the height, that gets accounted for with the way that we set up the rules. Because what you'll say is the duration is the volume. Like let's say you're pouring concrete. So the duration is the volume of concrete multiplied by the amount that the concrete pump produces every hour. You can then use the same recipe, the same template. Those rules are in the form of these recipes, as we call them. So you could use the same recipe for different sized elements, as long as the tasks are the same. If the second or third element in question has a different set of tasks, then yes, you need a different recipe. What's been very surprising to me, at least, is that before I started this, one of the reasons that the people think that, that Alice isn't possible is like, oh, construction is too complicated. There's too many rules. So you're like, okay, it turns out that you can hard code you can set up a project that needs to get that run with like 20 or 30 recipes. So where's the direction of this going? Now you've introduced modern technology into something that hadn't, at least in my mind, moved very fast. I mean, looking at the people building my house, I couldn't imagine that there was much that they were using that wasn't in use 50 years ago. Maybe mm -hmm. there was the odd laser level, but assuming the nail gun was around 50 years ago, then it was the same kind of technology. Now here are upsetting the apple cart in at least how they, they plan this kind of thing. You introduce new technology from a space where the growth rate is phenomenal uh, as opposed to, say, new ways of pouring concrete. Mm -hmm. So then that's got to evolve as well. Do you bring new AI and do you apply deep learning to learn rules or schedules? Where do you think this goes from here? Well, in my opinion, this really is kind of like a my opinion sort of statement, is that I don't believe there's a data set out there that you can currently learn from in our field. And so the issue that we're facing is that in other fields, there's been a lot of digitization that has occurred. And so you can create an algorithm that goes out there and crawls said data set or the web or the internet or whatever the heck it is and learns a whole bunch of useful stuff. With us, that digitization has not occurred. So there's definitely no database that you can go and purchase. I'll give you an example. So we generate schedules, lots of them. And so when you generate lots of schedules, somebody came to me three or four years ago and said, hey, I am going to sell you 40,000 schedules. And so I kind of went home, thought about it. And I called the gentleman in question. And I said, I really appreciate it, but I don't, I don't want to buy them. And he was very surprised. And he said, why not? I said, the schedules today are just Gantt charts. They're not connected to resources. They're not connected to the design. They're not connected to the 3D model. They're not connected to specifications. Like, there's just a lot of data that is missing. The only thing that you can glean from a schedule today is the description. And that is not standardized. The way that those descriptions are written, there's no standard formula for it, right? And so each person has their own way of doing it. So that's the question, like, today there isn't anything to learn from. What we've done with Alice, my opinion, is we've built the first system that actually simulates a construction project. Alice understands how to build. She understands what is a crane, what is a crew, what is the overtime. And so as she's simulating these things, we are learning from how she's doing it. So for us, the key thing that we want to start doing is we want to learn better ways to crunch those rules. Will we reach a point where we can recommend rules to somebody? Sure. The question becomes, in my opinion, what we're going to give our customers is the ability to either opt in or opt out. So you either say, yes, I want to opt into the pool, in which case you can use my anonymized data to feed your AI algorithm, and I want the results of that. Alternatively, no, I don't want to opt into anybody's pool. I want my own pool. And what's interesting is that what tends to be the differentiator here is the size of the company. So companies that are north of $5 billion generally tend to say, nope, we own data, own data pool, we want to do our own thing, right? Mm. Companies that are smaller, say two, $300 million company, they're more comfortable with sharing. Right. And you said there isn't a lot of data to learn from, referring to that deep learning needs lots and lots of data to generate mm -hmm. from. What else in this space doesn't exist that you would like to see that would really advance the state of the art? <laughs> That's a really simple answer from my side. We don't currently have a fully worked out conceptual process model. It's a mouthful, but what I'm trying to say is that I had a computer scientist come to me from the AI department. And the person said, hey, I want to go work on construction. I'm excited about it. And I said, well, wow, it's really great. I don't hear that a lot from AI folks. And the, the person said, well, can you point me to a book, right, where I could kind of read 
and understand what are the pieces of the puzzle that you want me to embody in the system I'm going to build. There's no such book. Like you can't pick something up where you're like, ah, I need to think about labor and equipment and materials and labor is defined as crews, which are made of individual, you know, people which have sort of a production rate, which, you know, these are the attributes. Like each company has their own kind of way of, of thinking about the universe, but we don't have a standardized way to think about it. And it exists in the design world, by the way. Do you want to write that book? I'd want to be a part of the group that writes it. I don't think it's, it's something that should be done by one entity. We as a company have, have built out this conceptual model. And so we have something that works for the problems that we're solving, but construction is wider than just our application. Hmm. So it would be great to talk to other folks that are working on other levels of detail or working on other types of problems. So you could have like one document that's sort of comprehensive. Suppose you found yourself back at university again and doing another PhD. Let's just say that's a constraint, hmm. but you get to choose what you research. What would that be? Hmm. One or two things. One is more theoretical, one is more practical. So I guess it depends which way you'd want to go. What's happening to construction today is what happened to manufacturing in the 80s, in the sense that it's getting digitized. So companies like mine and many other companies in our field are out there digitizing what's happening. So there's a digital representation of reality. What a lot of people don't realize is there's a digital representation of reality, but as I say, the bricks still have to go on top of each other. There's reality itself. The two worlds need to communicate. Mm -hmm. Very good point. So it's like, You've got the plans, but what ends up getting built is going to differ. I mean, I lost track of the number of things that changed from our plans. Exactly. Now, the way that you'd want to consolidate the two worlds is that you'd go out and you collect data from site. So that data is usually in the form of pictures or point clouds or laser clouds or whatever it is. The issue is that the data that you collect is not in the same format as the digital version, the plan, the schedule, the task, the estimate, whatever it is. Mm. How do you consolidate those two disparate data sets? That sounds like a great topic for a PhD. Right. And to do it, what you need is what I call a semantic translator. You need the software to start understanding basic concepts, in my opinion. And if you want to understand these basic concepts, you will need to go build out said conceptual model that I talked about and a whole bunch of other stuff because that conceptual model now has to interact between mm. these You'll need one for the digital and for the real world. And so that would be one area that I think is really the bleeding, bleeding edge of what's happening in our field. Unfortunately, thanks to advances in robotics and driven by autonomous vehicles, you've got things like drones and robots with simultaneous localization and mapping, and you can send LIDAR bots through a site to gather all kinds of data very rapidly, but potentially... So that, that could feed into something like that. Do you think that within a few years, a construction project, you'd have the foreman, you'd have the general contractor, you'd have the different project heads, and then you'd have the data engineer or the AI scientist next to them? Or would they be called that or something else? That's my dream. Hmm. I mean, if you think of what factories look like, call it early 1900s, yeah, you know, they were dirty places where most people didn't want to work. Windowless, smoggy oil, pollutants, polluting the environment, you know, et cetera. And you look at factories today and you think of, you know, oh, it's, it's high tech. Like if somebody working at a Toyota factory, mm -hmm. you don't think of said person being in some windowless room for 16 hours, inhaling fumes and getting dirty and grimy, right? I mean, that's not the image you get. You're thinking high tech, robotics, et cetera. And so for me, I would love to see our field moving towards a state where the average construction person has a much cleaner, nicer, better working hours, right? And in our field, we tend to work crazy hours, really do. Like it's normal to do 60-hour work weeks. And so to answer your question, I hope that we end up in a situation where you have the person who's responsible for the drywall robots, the person who's responsible for the bricklaying robots or the bricklaying whatever, or somebody that's responsible for the machines that are looking at alignment right? Or the as-built or, you know, someone that's responsible for data, right? Mm -hmm. Like, absolutely, right? And that's why when people are like, oh, you know, all this technology is going to take our jobs. It's been 120 years. Yeah. Well, I've seen yeah. video of a proof of concept drywalling robot. So it makes me want to ask what sort of automation of those kind of jobs can you see happening in construction in whatever time frame you want to pick? It's happening. 
I think that like other things, like what we're slowly going to see is clunky applications of very specific tasks. There's a robot that can tie rebar only for bridges, only for, you know, horizontal slabs that are not connected to any complicated, you know, et cetera. Like these are all the limitations, right? The drywall robot that can only do drywall, you know, up to a tolerance of X and without edges or complicated joints or something, right? So what I'm seeing is that what the robots will start doing is they'll pick certain parts of a process. They'll lay the bricks, but they won't be able to kind of build a, a corner wall, right? Or, or whatever it is, right? So yeah. what I think is that that's happening today and it will continue to happen. And those companies will continue to iterate and improve and iterate and improve. And so I think that what we'll slowly start seeing is that the robots will come in and start taking small parts of specific processes, you know, and with time, they'll get better and better and better, right? The timeline, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, 2030, yeah, you're going to have robots, in my opinion, that are doing a chunk of the work on construction sites. Will they do it all? No, I don't believe so. And I've seen that over and over again. It's less of a question of AI, more a question of IA, uh-huh. intelligence implementation. Right. And you, you see that over and over again. Could you reach a point where you sort of have a blueprint for a building and you kind of put in some kind of system and it opens some warehouse and some drones fly out and build the whole building for you and just call you in 18 months? <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe like, you know, 50, 100 years out, right? But I don't see that in the near future in the next, you know, 20 years, right? It's going to be, like I said, smaller, smaller pieces that are taking a bigger part of the process and a bigger part of the process. And what we've seen over and over with technology is that the human stops being the entity doing the crunching, or in this case, the building, the processing, and starts being the entity that sets up what needs to be crunched, i.e. the robot that lays the bricks, and then checks the results. Right. And then at some point you can sort of step back again and that piece of the puzzle is kind of what the robot does and so on and so forth. Wow. So here we're seeing the evolution of uh, ancient technology through the application of modern digital technologies, artificial intelligence. And that was news to me when I heard about it, that construction was being impacted in this way. So for a Anyone else who's listening, who's thinking that's news to them too, they want to find out more, how should they keep touch with what you're doing, follow that, or even get in touch with you if they've got questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, You can get on our website. There's a contact email there. You can also follow us on LinkedIn or YouTube. Yeah, it's relatively easy to stay in touch with what we're doing. AliceTechnologies.com. Terrific. Renny Morkos, thanks for coming on AI and You. Thanks for having me, Peter. Great to be here. That's the end of the interview. I thought it was interesting how the use of AI for resource optimization is steadily becoming more and more accessible to non-technical sectors. There's a link to Rene's company, Alice Technologies, in the transcript. In today's news, ripped from the headlines about AI, Baidu, which is roughly the Google of China, plans to launch a driverless taxi service in 100 cities by 2030. The service, called Apollo Go, which is roughly the phonetic equivalent of RoboTaxi in Chinese, currently operates in five Chinese cities. They want to expand to 65 cities by 2025 and then 100 by 2030. The news came out in their third quarter earnings call. There was no word on whether any of those cities would be outside of China. On the one hand, it's easy to be skeptical about any level four autonomous vehicle service. On the other hand, they are giving themselves some relatively generous lead time. Whether it turns out to be enough will be very interesting to watch. Right now, Level 4 services operate only in a few select and highly controlled environments, and I would be surprised if they're breaking even. You've heard in my interview with Todd Lippman of the Victoria Transport Policy Institute in episodes 61 and 62 just how hard Level 5 is going to be. But maybe the billions of dollars being spent on autonomous vehicles is going to carve out a space that's profitable in 10 years. I know I'll be keeping a close eye on what's happening in China. We are going from the concrete to the speculative next week, when my guest will be the scientist and science fiction author David Brin. He wrote the Uplift series and the novel The Postman, which became a movie with Kevin Costner. He has a PhD in astronomy and helped establish the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UC San Diego. It's going to be enormous fun next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, 
No matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A I A N D Y O U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.